Welcome to Today with Dr. K. I'm Dr. K.Y.'s Whitehead. I'm joined now by Dr. David Satcher, an award-winning physician, scientist, and public health administrator. He was the first African-American to serve as the 16th Surgeon General of the United States, the first Black four-star admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, the first Black to serve as the 10th Assistant Secretary for Health, and the first Black person to serve as the 13th Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Satcher is the founding director and senior advisor at the Satcher Health Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. He is the author of a book entitled My Quest for Health Equity, Notes on Learning While Leading. Dr. Satcher, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. How are you today, sir? Fine. How are you? It's good to be with you. Good to have you here. We have so many questions uh, that we've been pulling from our viewers, questions that we've been researching ourselves that we want to get into the conversation. Uh, health disparities were a big issue in the Deep South and even more so now with COVID-19. Uh, the Deep South exposed the health disparities amongst African Americans. Can you talk about the disparities kind of from the 1940s up until where we see ourselves today? Well, I think, um disparities in health have been with us for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And you may remember in uh, 2000, when we released the Surgeon General's um, Healthy People 2010 report, um, there were only two goals. One goal was to increase the years of healthy life that people lived as they aged. And the other goal was to eliminate disparities in health. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real challenge, continues to be, as you said, continues to be a challenge for us as a nation and as a people. So what came out earlier this week is there was a study that was done that looked at life expectancies of African-Americans and it found that black men lost three full years of life expectancy in the first six months of 2020, and Black women lost about 2.4 years or so. Can you talk about why our life expectancy is going down? I understand COVID-19, but what does that really mean? Well, I think certainly when you have a new challenge to our health, like COVID-19, then uh, it reduces life expectancy. And so uh, even though as you pointed out, our life expectancy has been short compared to uh, whites in this country. Uh, we, we are all losing years of life expectancy as we deal with this problem of COVID-19. And um, in, in, the, in the paper that we did uh, back in uh, 2016 about uh, differences in life expectancy, we put it in terms of years of life loss and basically showed that uh, African-Americans um, lost, uh, in, just take the year 20, uh, 2000 alone and compare life expectancy there with the life expectancy of whites. Even at that, looking at that window of going from one decade to another, you can see that the decrease in life expectancy is dramatic. This was a paper uh, written by Dr. George Russell and myself. Can you explain? What if we were equal is what we called it. What if we were equal? What if we were equal? But for some people who may not understand when they hear that life expectancy has been lost, uh, does that mean as a black woman, I'm only I'm going to live 2.4 years less than I would have lived before 2020? Does that mean that my health is getting worse? Like, what exactly does that mean that life expectancy is going down? because of COVID-19 from life? You know, that's a very, very good question. It, it, to, to talk about life expectancy, you have to talk about a group, a group of people. You can't do it on the basis of one person. Uh, you, take, you have to say that out of 100 black women and 100 white women, and you compare the number of years that you expect them to live, then you can talk about losing years of life, years of life loss. And that's what we did in the paper that we uh, wrote uh, in 2005. And with that in mind, I know that for you, uh, that it was because of a black doctor 
who treated you, I think when you were two years old, perhaps, that had a, a great impact on your career. Dr. Rabowski, the president of UMBC, an African-American man, talks about how it's important for young Black people to see Black doctors so they can see themselves in that position. Can you talk about the doctor who influenced you and why it's important for us to see role models that look like us? Well, I, I grew up uh, in Alabama, grew up on a 40 acre farm. Uh, I was um, in the middle of nine children and um, I became very ill at the age of about one and a half to two. And uh, black doctors were not allowed to admit patients to the hospital uh, during that time. This was the early 40s. Uh, so my dad went to town and convinced the, the one black doctor in Anderson, Alabama, <laughs> coming to see me. And that was Dr. Jackson. Dr. Jackson came out to the farm. He spent the whole day. He, he warned my parents when he left that he didn't expect me to live out the week, but he wanted them to know what they could do to make me comfortable and increase my chance of living. And um, well, the rest is history, here I am. So <laughs> I, um, I will always appreciate the fact that Dr. Jackson came out there to the farm to give it his best shot. And I think that's all that we're asked to do is to apply the knowledge that we have and to try to give everybody the best chance, not only of surviving, but surviving the maximum years. Now, like Dr. King, you have devoted your life to the civil rights movement. You were actually arrested on multiple occasions. Can you tell us about uh, the work that you have done, the, the civil rights activist work that you have done to ensure that African Americans and other people of color have the same access to health care and treatment as their white counterparts? Well, sure. I, I was sort of introduced to segregation and discrimination very early. I think I was four, four and a half, five years old when I went to town with my brothers and I, I had saved my money because I wanted to buy uh, an ice cream cone. So I went in the drugstore and asked the lady if I could have an ice cream cone. They were only five cents. And she said, no, we, we don't serve blacks in here. She didn't say blacks, but let's use that for the time being. Um, so that was a, a real shock to me because it's one thing to talk about segregation and discrimination. It's another thing to live it and to understand what it means, you know, for a four-year-old, five-year-old to go to town excited about the fact that he has saved money, he's going to get an ice cream cone, and in, ends up being told that he can't be served because he's black. That was my introduction, but it was really not until I got to Morehouse that I became really active in the movement. I, I have to give people like uh, Otis Moss, a name you might know, yes. outstanding <laughs> minister uh, who had just finished Morehouse and was in divinity school. He and Marion Wright Edelman. Marion was a sophomore at Spelman mm -hmm. and, um, and Otis Moss had just finished Morehouse and they got together and they were the leaders along with a couple of others, they were the leaders of the student movement. And when I heard about it, I said, this is my <laughs> chance to really fight for what I believe. And now this was important because now I, I went to Morehouse to, to plan to become a physician. So I didn't go there to go to jail. So that was not my plan, but I went to jail because I felt that this was important. And if we didn't deal with this issue, of segregation and discrimination, our children, our grandchildren and others were gonna pay a price more than an ice cream cone. What you have, uh, Dr. Satcher, is you also have the long eye of history. Like you have seen how we have come through so many trials and tribulations. Last night, a young person said to me, I feel like we're in the matrix. We keep fighting the same struggle over and over again. And I pushed back and said, you know, it may be a struggle. It's not the same struggle. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about that? That some, people, some young people feel that we're fighting the same thing over and over again. You were there. Well, you know, it's is interesting in that you say that because last night I was watching uh, the history of the black church, you know, uh, 
Henry Gates Jr.'s program. And at one point, um, talking to the person who was with me, I said, you know, it looks like we keep fighting these same bouts. When I was reminded again about the four children who died in the Birmingham 16th Avenue Church, mm -hmm. I spoke at the 50th anniversary of their death a few years ago. But it, it just reminded me last night that we have a lot of battles that we, we continue to fight because real change, uh, you know, eludes us. It just uh, escapes us in terms of uh, people. So we have to keep fighting. And sometimes you get tired, but you, you have to keep fighting until the battle is won. Now, in your first year as Surgeon General, you released the 1998 Surgeon General's Report, Tobacco Use Among U.S. Racial Ethnic Minority Groups. And in it, you reported that tobacco was on the rise among young people in each of the country's major racial and ethnic groups threatening their long-term prospects. Now that you can look back, can you talk about whether or not things have gotten better uh, and I'm thinking, of course, with the use of all these new drugs that have been introduced into the market, vaping and those type of things, or have things gotten worse when it comes to tobacco use among uh, the African-American? Well, I, I can say, and I'm delighted to be able to say, things have gotten better when it comes to tobacco use. Right. Now, in 1964, when Luther Terry uh, released his report on tobacco use among Americans, um, 40 3% of the American people were smokers. And uh, there were fewer African-Americans smoking than, than whites. However, today, less than 15% of the American people are smokers. So we made some progress when it comes to tobacco use. And that's why it's a very important point here because that's why it's so important for us to keep fighting because we may not win all of the battles, but we have to continue to work to win as many as possible uh, tobacco use is a major killer in this country. It's a major killer of African Americans. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent that we can, uh, we can improve the life expectancy and the and the health of African Americans. Now, Dr. Satcher, we have found very recently that that more Black women are dying during childbirth than, according to the New York Times and the study that was reported there, than they did during the latter half of slavery. And you couple that with this belief that, that Black folks have a higher tolerance for pain. Can you talk about some of the, the medical racism that still exists that makes it hard for people to say, trust the vaccine? Yeah, um, and, and I there's a chapter in the book about that, the book that I released in September. There's a whole chapter that deals with reproductive health and the fact that African-Americans uh, suffer more in the process of pregnancy and childbirth, et cetera. Black women, twice as likely to die, uh, you know, during pregnancy and delivery as white women in this country. So there is a difference. And uh, we're still trying to patch up the areas where there are differences. Mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to make sure that when it comes to pregnancy, uh, Black women are determined to be pregnant as soon as possible but also that they have good care from doctors that they trust while, you know, during their pregnancy. Uh, unfortunately, even until today, many uh, Black women don't seek care until later in pregnancy. And that's dangerous because, especially if you have risk factors, mm -hmm. risk factors, hypertension is a major risk factor during pregnancy, right? Uh, obesity is a major risk factor. These are things that increase your risk of dying during pregnancy. You put these things all together, and Black women are twice as likely to die during pregnancy than white women. We can change that. We have to change that. Dr. Satcher, how do we get um, people within the African-American community to trust the COVID-19 COVID vaccine? Where do you stand on that? Because we are doing a special push up for our show to help dispel some of the, the fears and concerns and the hesitancy around this. What, what's your professional opinion? How do you convince people? Well, number one, I'm very concerned that uh, we have vaccines now, and I believe the vaccines can save lives. Um, 
I've struggled with this issue of vaccines for a long time. When I went to the CDC, remember I was director of the CDC before I became Surgeon General. And one of the first things that I encountered was that black children were not getting their immunizations, you know, especially the ones that they're supposed to get before the age of two. And uh, so I developed a partnership with black churches, the National Council of Black Churches, and asked them if they would help us to, to make sure that black children got their vaccines. And I was very pleased with the job that the National Council of Black Churches did. Uh, they even immunized children in the basement of their churches. Uh, so, and so, and I feel the same way about this vaccine. Uh, I, I believe that the benefits of the vaccine for COVID-19 far outweigh the risk. Now, everything has some risk, risk to it. And I'm certainly familiar with Tuskegee. Look, I'm from Alabama. Tuskegee was the first college that I visited when I was in high school. I know about what happened in Tuskegee, but I also know how far we've come. Uh, when I was director of the CDC, I was able to get President Clinton to apologize, uh, honestly apologize for the Tuskegee study and to make some real commitments on behalf of the American people. So we can talk about what happened between 1932 and 1972, it was terrible, but we cannot let that prevent us from moving forward. We need to get rid of this virus, COVID-19. And it's gonna take vaccines to help do that. And um, you know, I, I listen to people as they talk to me about Tuskegee. I know more about Tuskegee than most people do, but again, because I, I, I was, I'm from Alabama and I've been there as director of the CDC. I worked with President Clinton. So I think it's time for us to move on uh, uh, to make sure that our people get the protection that they deserve when it comes to a disease like COVID-19. Don't forget, almost a half million people in this country have already died within one year. Almost a half million people have died from COVID-19. Uh, worldwide, over two million people. We're talking one year, over two million people have died from COVID-19. We got to move on. You know, it's easy to talk about uh, what happened at Tuskegee, and I certainly will never rest if I thought it was still happening now. I don't think it's still happening now, but I do think that we are able to develop vaccines now that can prevent death from a virus that's killing people right and left. Now, I just have a few more questions for you, and I'm speaking with Dr. Satcher, and I thank you so much. Uh, for your time today and for helping us to understand it. As someone who sat as a director of the CDC, so you, you have the ability to kind of see out and see what's happening uh, in this country when it comes to health. And as someone who sits on the board of Johnson & Johnson, the, the question that people are now asking each other, oh, which vaccine do you have? Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. And I tell people, tell me the name of your flu vaccine, your MMR vaccine. You don't know, but we are so involved in this that it's almost overwhelming. So, so how do people understand the different vaccines that they're more similar than they're different? If one is one shot with Johnson & Johnson and Moderna and Pfizer are two shots, for example. Well. I served on the board of Johnson & Johnson for 10 years. I'm not on the board now. I'm, I'm too old to be on boards. I'm almost 80. So, but I'm very proud of the work of Johnson & Johnson. I really am. Um, and I believe that when this vaccine is approved, it will make a big difference in terms of uh, access to vaccines to fight the COVID. It is true that the vaccine was made by studying the virus. So any way you look at it, this vaccine, whether you look at the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna or Johnson & Johnson or, or AstraZeneca, all of these, they are vaccines that have the ability to reduce the risk of this virus. And with all of the people dying that are dying every day, uh, we, we need to move forward. It doesn't mean, I want to be clear about this now, it doesn't mean the vaccine is perfect. It doesn't mean that every once in a while somebody will be sensitive to the vaccine. 
Um, in fact, I think I probably have some sensitivity, but I'm so happy that I've had both of my vaccines uh, with Pfizer, but I tend to be, uh, to have sensitivities uh, in the spring, you know, I react to uh, things. And so it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the vaccine. It just means we're all different. And so some of us are going to react differently than others, but not necessarily in a way that prevents the vaccine from doing its job. How concerned should we be about the different strains, the South African strain, Brazilian strain, UK strain? Like, how should we kind of make sense of very, that? You should be very concerned, and we should be working very hard. Ooh, okay. Because um, uh, the good thing about that, of course, is that we now know that uh, more so than I think any time before, the vaccine that was developed for this strain of virus is working in other strains. So when somebody says uh, the vaccine, uh, the Pfizer vaccine works against the vaccine that was made in South Africa, that's great news. It just says that this is a very strong vaccine. It doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case. But we're talking about less than 1% of people reacting to negatively to the vaccine. For the most part, the vaccine is very effective. There is no question about that. Now, my last question for you, uh, you'll be speaking at a free event on Monday, February 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m. in conjunction with Promise Heights. Now, if people want to get more information, promiseheights.org. Can you talk about that activity that's coming up? Well, um, I'm, I'm excited about being able to be involved um, in the program there. I think, uh, I think it's a very important program. I think we've got to do more have more of these kinds of discussions. And uh, I do a lot of, of speaking and writing. Of course, uh, my book has uh, just come out in September mm -hmm. called uh, My Quest for Health Equity. And I look forward to talking about that and to all of the different kinds of questions that will arise about my life. And, and I know you've read some of those stories. Uh -huh. So, you know, the, the experience that I've had in terms of my life experience is something I enjoy talking about. I'm proud of my parents, neither of whom finished elementary school, but who were determined that their children were going to get an education. I've tried to make the best of that. And so um, that's what I look forward to. I look forward to discussing that and, yeah. and talking yeah. about Morehouse. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was the first Surgeon General to. Uh, do a report on mental health. Mm. And I'm proud of that report because I think it is making a positive difference. And as you know, even with COVID-19, uh, the mental health issue is front and center. Uh, people who've, had, who've been infected with the COVID virus uh, can suffer mental, a type of mental illness. Um, I think, um, I don't think it's as serious as the disease itself but it's a carryover from the disease. Kind of the long-term effects and impacts of it. I think once we get through this vaccine, I do think other things are going to come, like you're saying, whether yeah. it's mental health issues, it's issues with young people being out of school for a year. Yeah. Uh, it's this, even the health disparities of just spending your day sitting on the couch yeah. rather than walking around, the simple act of leaving the house. I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, Dr. Satcher. You, of course, a lot more knowledgeable about this than I am, but I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge going back to whatever the new normal is going to be. It is. Um, let me just tell you, um, as you pointed out, I'm, I'm, all, I'm almost 80 years old, very close. I mean, that close. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I believe that the vaccine, and I've had both, are much more beneficial than they are risky. And as I told you before, I think the risk is pretty low. Doesn't mean that there's not gonna be somebody every once in a while who has a reaction to the vaccine. I react to things that you would never react to because of my allergies. We, you know, people have different allergies. So it is true that some people may have a reaction to the vaccine, but the benefits of the vaccine far outweigh the risk. 500,000 people have died from this virus already this year in this country. 
and then worldwide over 2 million people. It's a lot of people to die in one year. Um, it's amazing. So yeah, the, the vaccine is not perfect, uh, but certainly we need to get as many people to get the vaccine as we can. I strongly encourage it. Dr. Satcher, thank you so much, sir. We appreciate your time. Dr. Thank Satcher. Thank you. It's yes. great being with you. I'm sorry. Have, no, it's great having you. Dr. Satcher is an award-winning physician, scientist, and public health administrator, first African-American to serve as the 16th Surgeon General of the United States, first Black four-star Admiral of the United States, Public Health Service Commission Corps, first African-American to serve as the 10th Assistant Secretary for Health, and the first African-American to serve as the 13th Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. His book came out in 2020, My Quest for Health Equity, Notes on Learning While Leading. Sir, it's been an honor and a privilege to speak with you, and thank you for your service to this country and, of course, to, to making your parents proud. Thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. It's great being with you.